Among the most important items in the Roman collections of the Grosvenor Museum are its lead ingots. There are three of these found in or near Chester, and there is a plaster cast of another one found near Hollywell and now in the National Museum of Wales at Cardiff. They are unprepossessing objects, but the stories they te tell take us to the heart of the way that the Roman economy operated, and they shed light on some of the motives behind the Roman invasion of Britain. Writing in the reign of the Emperor Augustus, before the Roman invasion of Britain, the Greek geographer Strabo included gold, silver and iron, but surprisingly not tin, among the exports of the island. At the end of the first century AD, the historian Tacitus listed gold, silver and other metals as being among the prize of victory for the invaders. Finally, the encyclopedist Pliny the Elder, who died in the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79, said that lead was so common and so easily extracted from surface deposits in Britain that its production was restricted to protect the longer established but harder to work mines in Gaul and in Spain. In the reign of Hadrian, the historian Arian wrote about Britain, they, that is the Romans, have occupied the better and greater part of it, but they do not care for the rest, for even the part that they do occupy is not very profitable to them. Roman economic thinking was primitive by our standards, but clearly they had some ideas of the profitability of individual provinces. Perhaps 50% of taxes were spent on the, on the armies, of which three legions, about 15,000 men, plus perhaps the same number of auxiliary non-citizen soldiers were stationed in Britain. To make things worse, the highland zones of Britain, in which most of these troops were stationed, were agriculturally poor, and cereals in particular had to be imported from other areas of Britain, or perhaps even from abroad. So, the exploitation of Britain's mineral wealth was not just a prize of victory, a bonus, but essential to make the military occupation worthwhile, and would have been a great feather in the cap of a commander or the provincial governor. It was in the highland zones of Britain, the Pennines, the Peak District, the Marches, Wales and the West Country, that most of these resources were to be found. Within striking distance of Chester were the copper mines of Paris Mountain on Anglesey to the west, Alderley Edge to the east and Thanamanic to the south, plus the lead silver mines of Flintshire. We don't think of Britain as being a great producer of minerals nowadays, but we should remember that in the 1790s, Paris Mountain was the greatest copper mine in the world. Today, I want to focus on the lead silver mines of Flintshire. Three ingots have been found at Chester, all of the usual trough shape into which lead was cast for transport in bulk and weigh between 74 and 86 kilos. Two have a cast inscription with the name of the Emperor Vespasian, with titles that allow the ingots to be dated to AD 74. On the third, we can read the title Caesar, but so far we haven't been able to interpret the rest of the inscription. On the side of the first two inscriptions, we can read the name Decaeang, which refers to the tribe of the Decaeangli of Flintshire. Their name was preserved in that of the medieval Welsh cantref of Tegingle. The first two ingots were clearly lost in transit. One was found in 1886 in Riversilts by the side of the railway viaduct over the Dee during construction of the gas works, along with iron shod timbers, apparently from a jetty. The other was found in 1838, just east of Tarvin Bridge during construction of the railway line, and probably lay beside the Roman Road from Chester to Northwich, Manchester, and onwards to York. The third ingot was found in 1849, several feet below ground, built into a wall in Common Hall Street. We can't make any sense of its fine spot any more than we can uh, of, the, of the text of the inscription. Ingots with cast inscriptions featuring imperial names and titles and assigning them to the Decaeangli have been found elsewhere. Two, dating to AD 76, have been found near the route of Watling Street near Tamworth. 
and 20 were found before 1590 on the south shore of the River Mersey near Runcorn and can be dated to AD 76 and 84 to 96. Again, all of these ingots look as if they were lost in transit. Unfortunately, the Runcorn ingots have now been lost. There are two other ingots that clearly come from the Flincher mining field. One found near Hollywell in 1950 and another found at Rosset in 2019. The first is now in the National Museum of Wales at Cardiff, where there is a plaster cast in the Grosvenor Museum. This ingot has a very finely cast inscription naming not an emperor, but a private individual, Caius Nippius Ascanius. The last name, Ascanius, is Greek and suggests that this man may have been a former slave who was freed and given Rome citizenship. His name also appears in a stamped inscription on an ingot from the Mendic mining field found in Hampshire. This ingot carries a cast inscription naming the Emperor Nero and can be dated to AD 60. We think that Ascanius was acting as some sort of agent or middleman uh, in in the Mendes, who then began mining on his own account in Flintshire. The Rosset ingot was found by a local metal detectorist, Rob Jones, who reported it to the local finds liaison officer for the Portable Antiquities Scheme, Dr Susie White. Fortunately, the ingot was acquired by Wrexham Museum, where it is now on display and has been the subject of a lot of detailed study. I talked to Rob and Susie about the discovery. We've come to Wrexham Museum to see the Rosset ingot. It's on permanent display here now after being in a temporary exhibition at the British Museum in London. So first of all, many thanks to the staff at Wrexham Museum for opening up early uh, so that we can do this filming and to Rob Jones, the finder, and to uh, Dr Susie White, uh, the Portable Antiquities Scheme finds the liaison officer for North Wales for coming in to talk to us. So, Rob, you found the ingot. Can you tell us a bit about the discovery and how it actually ended up in the uh, museum here as such a wonderful uh, exhibit? Well, back in 2019, um, it was just a normal day's detecting. Um, I was finding usual stuff, buttons, drinks, cans, usual rubbish really, there was yeah. a lot of waste on the field and then as I got to the far end of the field I came across a huge signal and it was, it maxed the machine out, it was massive. Mm -hmm. um, I managed to dig down and the signal was still there, I got down to 12 inches and I seen just a corner of white lead so I knew it was ancient lead. As I started to excavate the hole a bit more um, I couldn't see the writing to start with and I'd, I'd opened the trench and I just brushed off the soil and there stood out that Roman writing so my first thought was I've got something important here yeah. so then I, I give yeah. Susie a ring and I, and I said you know I think I found something good so I said right take a photo and get the coordinates down and we'll record it at a you know they, they, so I sent a picture and within a couple of minutes she rung back and said stop what you're doing we're on our way so, <laughs> so within 15 minutes her and Steve were there on the dig excavated it and the rest is history really you know it's yeah. now on display yeah that's that's great uh, and, I, and I'm just so glad that it's here for the local people you know to you know, see our history and you know expand. Yes, yeah, it's been a <clears throat> major feature of this whole area from Roman times, uh, certainly up up to the nineteenth century. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Susie, uh, I've got uh, two main questions for you. Uh, the first is about the inscription on the ingot. Um, and as anybody can see from the display here, it's very long and it's incredibly difficult to read. I still struggle with it. Uh, the letters are all jumbled up on different levels and so on. So uh, can you talk us through uh, what the inscription actually says and uh, why it's important? Okay. 
Well, it is an unusual one because, because of the length of the inscription. And what has happened is they've actually done what we call ligatured the letters, mm. so they've joined them together. It actually shows up better on, on here where they've actually got the, the P and the R of um, Prov, the provincial, um, actually joined together. Yeah. And so you've, you've then got to kind of unpick things. And they've also um, put some of the letters on two lines as well. So where we've actually got Maximo here for Maximus, um, they've put it on two lines. So that's how they've managed to... Um, to get quite so much lettering in. Um, but what actually stood out for us was the, the name Treb Max, which is short for Trebellius Maximus. And of course, that's the key person. And so from that, we were able to then look at the rest of the inscription. Um, Trebellius Maximus was the governor of, of Britain mm. between 63 and 69 AD. And so we were able from that to work out that it must have been um, Nero, who was, who was the emperor. Yeah. And we have just here at the beginning of the um, inscription Caesar, so Caesar Og, so you've got um, the Emperor Caesar Augustus, but of course his name's been cut off, yeah. possibly deliberately, yeah. um, and it would have said Nero, yeah. we could get Neronis. Yeah. So you've got the Emperor Caesar Augustus, and then this little piece in here we can't actually read, and we think this is the, the place where the, the ink had actually came from. Um, probably a place called Magul, which is somewhere that we, we don't know of, but it's basically saying property of Caesar Augustus, it's Brit, Britic, British led from Magul, and it's smelted in the province um, where Trebellius Maximus was legate, so we've got Treb Maximo Leg Org, so the Imperial yes. Legate. Yeah, that's quite unusual in a lot of ways because um, the, the imperial titles are fairly normal on ingots, but uh, this word fusum, where it was cast, yes. uh, I can't think of another example from Britain, uh, and I can't think of another British ingot where you've got the governor's name. Uh, <coughs> uh, you, the imperial titles, they're uh, standard enough, yes. and we've got uh, the name of governors on um, lead water pipes at Chester, but having one uh, on an ingot is really quite unusual. And of course, uh, getting a new, the name of a governor who's not been attested before on an inscription and a new place name is uh, yeah, really um, gilding the lily or whatever, isn't it? Well, absolutely. I mean, this, this was what was exciting about it because we knew Trebellius Maximus wasn't known other than through literary sources. So this yeah. is the first actual evidence that we have, an yeah. actual inscription of him. Uh, so moving on to my second question, uh, I, you've overseen the study that's been done on the ingot, and there's been quite a lot of laboratory analysis, um, both to try and find out uh, where it came from, and uh, also uh, the silver content and so on. So what can you tell us about that? Well, we, first of all, we had some um, XRF done on the, the ingot, but that only deals with the very top few millimetres of the, of the ingot, and mm -hmm. that can be contaminated through time and the fact that it's been buried. So we also did some lead isotope analysis, which meant that they were able to take small samples from a little bit further inside the ingot. Mm -hmm. um, and they analysed those and discovered that there, there was a reasonable silver content, but silver content in the ingot actually varies quite, quite a lot. But it was also the combination of the silver content and the um, other trace elements in it that acted like a fingerprint, yeah. which was able meant that we were able to actually look at um, similar results. And we pinned it down, we think, to Holkin Mountain, which is, is nice. That's a nice local source. So whether this Magol is somewhere out near um, Holkin Mountain, um, is, is the million dollar question really, yes. but, um, but that's what we're, we're hoping for. But the other interesting thing was that you've got different kind of levels within the, the ingot um, that look like different pourings or the, the way in which the ingot was constructed. So it's all, all been very interesting. Yes, okay. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'm right in thinking that you ultimately concluded that uh, this uh, ingot was probably smelted from lead ore that wasn't particularly rich in, in silver. Yes, yeah. 
but we don't think that it's been desilvered no. at all. Um, right. Because of the trace elements, it doesn't look like it's been yeah. desilvered. Some, yeah. some of the elements, particularly things like arsenic, um, that would have disappeared during the cupellation um, process, are still present. Yeah. And the other big question, of course, which I've only just thought of, is uh, where on earth was this ingot going? Because this was a time when we're not sure that there was any military presence at Chester. So it could have been headed there, or was it headed uh, further south, perhaps via a river crossing at Holt Farnham on its way to Rochester or wherever? The, well, these were all things to think about in the future. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Um, it, would, it would be nice to be able to be a fly on the wall oh, yeah. back, back then and find yes. out what it was that was going on, so yes. Lead was important in the Roman world for a variety of uses. Pliny the Elder tells us that it was used for sheets and pipes. And another important item in the Grosvenor Museum's collection is a lead water pipe with an inscription mentioning the joint emperors Vespasian and his son Titus, uh, together with the provincial governor Agricola, and can be dated to AD 79. However, lead ore, galena, sometimes contains appreciable amounts of silver, which was important to the Roman state for maintaining the supplies of the, of the coinage. The British ore field richest in silver was that in the Mendix, and was quite quickly reached and exploited by the Romans a lead ingot or plaque dating from AD 49, only six years after the invasion of 1843, was found near Wookie Hole, about 1540. Isotope analysis of local native coins show that it made some use of Mendic silver, and so that this ore field was known and exploited before the Roman invasion, but perhaps surprisingly surprisingly, not in great quantities. The datable ingots show us that Roman mining had started in Flintshire by the 60s of the first century. We believe that that decade was a quiet one militarily, between the attack by the governor Suetonius Paulinus on Anglesey, which was followed immediately by a withdrawal to deal with Boudicca's rebellion and the ensuing devastation, and the final conquest of the whole of Wales in the early to mid 70s, marked by the conquest of the two legionary fortresses at Chester in the north and at Caerleon on the Usk in the south, together with a dense network of forts in between. In the 60s, the nearest legionary fortress to northeast Wales was at Roxter near Shrewsbury, and it is possible that there was also an early fort at Whitchurch. However, coin finds at Holt and also at Chester could suggest activity at these sites in the 60s. Short lengths of ditches found during the building of the Forum complex in the 1960s, shown in red on the plan, hint at two phases of military occupation predating the legionary fortress at Chester. Finally, there is the possibility of a fort at Satan, found a few years ago by a LIDAR survey. So, the two earliest ingots, produced by Caius Nippius Ascanius, and during the governorship of Tibelius Maximus, seem to belong to a time when northeast Wales had been pacified but not finally occupied. The exploitation of the Flintshire ore field before it seemed to have been under firm military control could suggest that the Romans at least hoped to find worthwhile quantities of silver there, as they had done in the Mendips. In AD 47-8, the governor Ostorius Scapula launched a raid on people called the Decangi, whom we assume were the same as the Decangli of Flintshire, ravaging their whole territory and collecting much booty as Tacitus tells us. I've often wondered if the comment about collecting booty hints that the tribe was exploiting its silver resources rather than it just being a stock expression in praise of a successful ex expedition. But as yet, there's no actual evidence for pre-Roman Iron Age exploitation. Silver mining in Flintshire was certainly profitable in the 18th century, and there's no reason why it should not have been so in earlier times. The results of the analysis of the Rosset ingot suggested that it was produced from ore that was poor in silver. The other ingots that have been analysed also contain low levels of silver, but it's been assumed in these cases that they were made from metal that had been deliver deliberately desilvered. Hulkin Mountain was once one of the most important zinc and lead ore fields in Wales. 
Unfortunately, because of that richness, clear signs of Roman workings have been obliterated by exploitation in later centuries. So we are largely reliant on the circumstantial evidence of the ingots and processing sites nearby. However, copper vessels said to be of Roman origin were discovered during the sinking of a shaft in the mid 18th century. I'm standing on Halkin Mountain, uh, once one of the most important lead and zinc ore fields in Wales. I've j uh, joined our member, Dr. Alan Williams, who's made a special study of ancient mining and has published on uh, uh, flincher lead uh, to learn more about mining here and some of the technical processes involved. Uh, so, Alan, um, the first question is, we know there was Roman mining here uh, if only because of the processing site uh, down by the BFG at Pensifundan. But uh, can we identify any actual Roman ma uh, mine workings on the mountain itself? Well, that's really difficult because the, the whole of uh, Halkin Mountain is a, a whole complex, a palimpsest of mine workings that stretch back 2,000 years or more. So it's very difficult to untangle what belongs to what period. But um, we think that the most likely sources for the Roman mining would be the, the near surface mining. And in fact, at this moment, we're standing in the open cast along the old rake vein. Uh, and uh, also very close by is another vein called the Long Rake, uh, on which uh, in 1760 they found some bronze vessels. So we can be fairly sure at least the Long Rake was worked, and maybe this one as well. But it's really difficult to, to untangle. OK, so thanks for that. And um, uh, lead, leading on from that, how accessible would lead ore have been in ancient times? How easy would it have been easy, easy, how easy would it have been to extract? Well, I mean, here we're, we're, we're standing in the middle of an open cast vein that's been worked out. And on one side of us is the one rock face, and on the other side, the other rock face. So clearly this was a huge vein that was outcropping at the surface. So that would have been quite easy to work. I mean, obviously they had uh, iron tools and they could have potentially used fire setting if they wanted, although we don't have evidence for that at this site. OK. And, uh, 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 how, thinking about uh, getting silver, do any uh, deposits, uh, do any ores uh, have uh, greater quantities of silver than others? Well, indeed they do, and uh, cer certain uh, lead deposits are known to have very high levels uh, in, in certain areas. The situation here in Flintshire is variable. Some areas uh, have uh, quite relatively low and some areas are relatively high. And in fact, we think that there are surface processes that mean that the surface veins are actually richer in silver. And in fact, the 18th century mines had much higher silver levels than the 19th century ones. So that indicates that the earliest workings from Roman and pre-Roman periods been had, would have had uh, higher silver than later workings. Right, okay, so getting a bit more technical now, uh, how do you actually go about uh, extracting the silver uh, from, the, from the lead? Well, essentially you smelt the lead ore, which is lead sulphide, galena, uh, you smelt it under reducing conditions to form lead metal. You then extract the silver in from the lead metal and you do this with a process, an ancient process of cupellation where you use an oxidizing uh, environment to, to smelt the metal with a bone a calcium phosphate base and the lead uh, oxidizes to litharge and uh, volatilizes uh, or it gets absorbed into the uh, cupel uh, and that leaves the silver behind. Right, and the key question, which uh, I know has been uh, hotly debated, but uh, how much silver do you need uh, to have in the lead before it's worth going to the trouble of uh, cupellation to, to extract it? 
Well, there's been a big uh, debate about that, and we, I don't think we really know. We know we know that some some deposits <coughs> had ten times as much as others, but it would depend on the economic situation at the time as to what the silver was worth. So uh, I think it's very uh, dangerous to put an absolute figure on because it would have varied through time. But we, we, we know that uh, uh, certainly in the 19th century, all the lead from Flintshire was, the silver was extracted, obviously the technology was better. Uh, so I think that a lot of the lead from Flintshire would have been worthwhile uh, extraction silver, e even in, uh, especially in ancient times when the high silver loads near the surface were being worked. Elsewhere in the area, Roman objects, a bronze bracelet, wedge, coins and tools have been found over the years since 1704 in the Talal mine on Graigvar near Dissert, still important in the 19th century, and a bathhouse and traces of a settlement nearby at Prostatin. There also seems to have been some sort of settlement, as yet poorly understood, at Freeth, north of Wrexham, which has been associated with lead mining. The, the discovery of the Rosset Ingot only five mile, miles away gives new support to this idea. So, how long did the Roman mining industry in Flintshire last? How was it organised? And how important was the recovery of silver? The answers to these three questions are all intertwined. The dates of the Flintshire ingots as a whole are restricted to the 60s to 90s of the first century. Elsewhere in the country, we find ingots with cast inscriptions that belong to the second century, as late as the 160s in the Mendix. The building at Pentrefunda that is thought to have been the administrative centre for mining on Halkin Mountain is, has been dated from AD 120 to 240 and the Prestatin bathhouse and settlement for, uh, from AD 70 to the 160s. So activities seem to have extended considerably later than is suggested by the ingots alone. It's worth noting the wreck of a ship carrying lead ingots from Britain, found off the north coast of Brittany, has been dated to the 3rd or 4th century. These ingots were not the normal uh, trough shape, but were cast in a variety of shapes, and only a few of them had inscriptions. In the same way, after the late 1st century, lead from Fincher could have been cast into variously shaped uninscribed ingots, uh, without inscriptions, so that even if we found them, we wouldn't know where they came from. It's assumed that ingots with cast inscriptions naming an emperor indicate all fields that were under direct government management and would generally have been rich in silver, such as the Mendips, whereas the poorer ore fields were leased to private individuals or companies. Some of these individuals and companies are named in inscriptions, but others may not have been. So it's possible that the lack of later ingots with imperial inscriptions from Flintshire means that the Roman government quickly exhausted the silver-rich veins that it could find and then left it to unrecorded lessees to work the mines uh, purely for their lead content. More widely, from the 3rd century, there seemed to be a shift across the empire to less state involvement and to small-scale mining. However, at any one time, the ore from a silver mining area could contain varying amounts of silver, and as we've seen, the first imperial ingot from Fincher, the one from Rosset, was made from ore relatively poor in silver. Deciding whether to use labour and fuel to extract silver from lead, from the Fincher or any other mines, would not simply have been a local technical question, nor would it have been dependent on a fixed amount of silver in the lead. It would have been bound up with the productivity of other mines in Spain, present-day Serbia, and from the early 2nd century in Romania. So who did the hard work in the mines, at the rock face, and at the furnaces, and where did they live? I'm not aware that any specific evidence for the Flincher mines has emerged. Much mining and quarrying in the Roman world was done by criminals, slaves, and doubtless prisoners of war, symbolized by this little figure of a bound captive found at Holt. However, small-scale workings may have been operated by the free population. Maybe further research at Pantry will shed light on this subject.
How much silver might the Fincher mines have produced in Roman times? These calculations are inevitably based on lots of assumptions and shouldn't be taken too seriously. But estimates vary from about 320,000 to 500,000 denarii silver coins per year. In the late first century, that would have covered the pay of 1,000 to 1,600 legionary soldiers, uh, one-fifth to a third of a legion uh, before stoppages. That's the end of our story for today. It's inevitably been a complicated one. We've di dipped into geology, metallurgy, Roman e economics and administration. But I hope you've followed the story and enjoyed it. There's still much to learn. If you're interested, please join the Society and help us to fund this and other research.